Um, thank you very much, Commissioner, for that introduction and also the invitation to be speaking today. Um, I'm, I'm unable to travel at the moment, so I'm very sorry that I couldn't be there in person. Um, and also this uh, presenting via Zoom is new to me, so uh, please uh, bear with me if I, if I make any uh, errors. So what I will be talking um, about today is the impact of transition for, out of the ADF on mental health. Um, and I do have some slides that I'm going to uh, be referring to, which I'm just sharing now. Okay. So um, I want to start this talk um, <clears throat> by noting a few things. Um, and uh, I think after the last talk that we had, um, uh, this is going to sound a bit more political than I had intended. Um, however, um, I, uh, this presentation will be focused on understanding those who demonstrate the biggest risk of poor mental health uh, transition and suicide. So I want to be clear that this is not to diminish or minimise the large proportion um, of current and former ADF members that do not have mental health difficulties or do not transition with any difficulty, or even those who do have mental health concerns but continue to transition well. So I don't want to, um, uh, I want everyone to be aware of, of that, I suppose, as, as I start. And I also want to acknowledge um, the, the vast amount of work that has been done by Departments of Defence and Veteran Affairs to address um, the increased rates of mental health and suicide. And in particular, um, I do, I have seen a big change in the veteran-centric reform initiatives that have um, been rolled out by DBA. And as a clinical psychologist, there have been uh, particular changes that have made a big impact on how we deliver services. Um, first of all was the um, non-liability mental health care initiative that was introduced uh, a few years ago and just this year there has been um, a revision of the rates for clinical psychologists that, that is going to uh, greatly improve access to care I think. So I just want to acknowledge that, um, those changes that have been made. Um, in, in the same sense, I do also want to say that, that you know, we've all said today and, we, and yesterday and we can all agree that, that one suicide is too many. And so if what we're aiming for is zero suicides, then there's always going to be more that we can do. And the way that we do this is um, there's no way around it. We need to be learning from those who have experienced the worst and even if they're in the minority. We also do want to learn from those who have, a who have had a positive experience and trajectory, and we need to figure out why, why is that their experience different and why was it different for the minority that don't do well. So I also want to be clear that there hasn't actually been any research done in Australia investigating the direct relationship between transition experiences and completed suicide. So what we're taught, what I'm going to be talking about um, today is really uh, the idea of potential risk factors as well as trajectories that may um, lead to mental health difficulties and ultimately suicide. So with all that said, let's move now into um, the hard figures of mental health and transition. So uh, uh, Sandy McFarland, who was instrumental in these studies, has also already given you a, quite an in-depth look uh, previously at, at these um, findings of these reports, but it's important uh, for me to sort of reiterate uh, the, the findings in relation to transition specifically. So this gives us an understanding of the, the top level mental health prevalence and, and these studies really give us the best estimates we have in terms of mental health, uh, what happens with mental health when people transition. So the Transition and Wellbeing Research Program that was released in 2018 and, that, and commissioned by uh, DBA and Defence. Um, and this is all about the prevalence. Um, and as um, Sandy mentioned previously, that the study of the, men the transitioned uh, mental health prevalence study was also conducted by the same group at the University of Adelaide um, who conducted the mental health in the Australian Defence Force report. And that was in 2010. So as he said, they were able to uh, track the people 
who take a look back at the cohort uh, from 2010 and determine what happens to mental health rates as people transition. So do they go up, do they go down, do they stay the same? Um, and as uh, Sandy said, what they found was quite alarming. Um, and that was that as, as service personnel transition, at, transition out, there is a sharp rise in mental health conditions. And in fact, the mental health prevalence nearly doubles when comparing those who are serving versus those who have discharged. And what has also been mentioned previously is that they found an estimated 46% of transition personnel met criteria for a mental health condition within the first five years following discharge. So that's one and two potentially. The other important um, information to look at, again, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, uh, of course, uh, being part of this symposium, um, but I just want to, of course, mention that uh, what has been consistently found um, in the work by the AIHW, National Suicide Monitoring of Service and Ex-Serving uh, ADF Personnel, is that the adjusted age adjusted rate of suicide among current serving personnel is lower than the general Australian population, but the age adjusted rate of suicide among ex serving members is higher than the general Australian population and quite substantially so. This is really giving us a confirmation that this area is of great importance. It tells us, um, it gives us a sense of the magnitude of the problem. And what is clear is transition is a crucial component of the health and well-being of the veteran community. Um, but what these studies can't show us um, just by the nature of the methodology is, is why. Why is it that the rates of mental health conditions and completed suicides increases following transition? What is actually going on for people at this time um, uh, that might be contributing to the deterioration of, of mental health? So then when we think about um, our own transition and reintegration research at, at the Gallipoli Medical Research Foundation here in Brisbane, um, we really wanted to investigate this and, and think, uh, think about the transition experience in of itself and what are people going through when they transition and attempt to reintegrate back to civilian life. And we've done this um, really over the last six years and we have uh, progressed through a number of phases of this body of work. Phase one was a qualitative investigation and it was an absolute must to start with this lived experience framework, which, which was the qualitative methodology, actually talking to people who had experienced transition and, and getting a much richer and deeper understanding of what are the challenges. And this was the first study to be conducted in Australia to do this. Phase two, then we looked, uh, we went to the literature, the international literature, and we wanted to examine um, specifically psychological adjustment post service. Phase three was then moving to the survey type data, the quantitative data, and we did a survey with 725 ex serving personnel. And then phase four, which is currently ongoing, is also a quantitative investigation, but this is of currently serving ADF. And right now where we have about 225 um, participants and we're uh, still recruiting data for that. So for the phase four, what we're actually doing is, is um, tracking members before and after they separate. So I'm going to talk about all each of these phases in turn. So to start with the qualitative investigation, um, as I mentioned, uh, as part of this, um, the aims of this study, it was really to understand the lived experience of transition and reintegration. We wanted to know what are the key challenges that people are facing in this um, process. We also wanted to have a sense of what are the differences between those who transition well and those who have a lot of difficulty in their transition. And why do some people have um, really struggle and some people seem to be fine? So determining in a way the factors that lead to an effective or problematic transition. This um, study, as I said, had a, a very specific qualitative methodology and that include um, 
100 interviews and focus groups with the following uh, participant groups, so ex-serving personnel, um, partners of ex-serving personnel, and also mental health clinicians and transition coaches <clears throat> that obviously specialise with defence population, have a lot of knowledge and uh, experience with people during the transition process. It was really important to... Um, to ensure that uh, we, we, I spoke to different data sources, so something we call triangulation of the data and qualitative research, and that increases trustworthiness and validity. Um, we use maximum variation sampling, so the, the sample size of 100 is actually very large for um, a qualitative piece of work, and it's one of the largest uh, qualitative studies on transition globally. But we needed to do uh, this, we, we needed to have a large enough group to make sure that we were getting a mix of services ranks, types of discharge, for instance, to make sure we're not um, necessarily just fo focusing on one particular group or getting a single perspective. And that really lended itself to understanding those who transitioned without difficulty versus those with. So I um, conducted all the interviews and focus groups. I did have an interview um, guide, not so much. It wasn't structured. It was sort of semi, between semi and unstructured. Um, I did have some predetermined open questions going into it, but I allowed the interview to be really guided by the participants. And in a sense, people were able to just talk about what was most crucial and important to them. The interviews were around 60 to 180 minutes and all up in combination with the focus groups. This equated to 180 hours of audio recorded interviews, which were then transcribed and, and thematically analysed um, by the, the, the program in Vivo. So looking at the uh, demographics very briefly of this study, um, a couple of things to point out. I won't spend a lot of time on this. As you can see, the participants were predominantly male. They were predominantly from the army, uh, which I suppose is keeping in uh, with the with the breakdown of the of the ADF in general. Fifty five percent were medically discharged, so that group was slightly overrepresented. Um, but we did have a good range of military ranks, so from private through to brigadier level, for instance. As part of the analysis, um, certainly we were able to see what some of the most common challenges for members were in the transition uh, journey and process. In the interest of this talk, however, um, I am just really going to focus on this at-risk group that was identified by the AIHW study. So those ex-serving non-commissioned who were medically discharged. So I have streamlined my focus to, to be in relation to this group in particular. And so of that group, um, the most dominant challenges really were uh, these three things, mental health stigma, poor mental health literacy, and delayed access to evidence-based treatment. So mental health stigma, <clears throat> there remains a stigma of being injured um, and the way you are sub subsequently treated when you are not able to perform in your role. So defence has a very positive culture of teamwork um, and that's without a doubt teamwork and camaraderie. But at the same time, the message is also that you're only as good as your weakest link. So that means that those that who, who, are, who are injured, either, either physically or men uh, mentally actually, it, that's interpreted as weakness and letting the team down. Um, there's also the practicality of being injured um, and, and the impact on your team. You know, you, there's no one there to cover you if you're on sick leave. There's no one there to pick up the slack. So everyone else has to um, pitch in and do that for you. And from that, a, a lot of resentment can build from the team. And what ends up happening is then members who are injured feel, feel very ostracised from the group. Uh, there's also this idea of people being called a linger. So they're uh, in terms of being malingering and being treated as, as, as if they are faking their injuries. And particularly if, if it's a mental health injury that can't be seen. So these uh, findings were really in line with the um, 2010 ADF mental health prevalence study, which I just mentioned, because they showed that, that nearly 
3% of ADF members reported that, that they would be, quote, would be seen as weak and that people would treat me differently if suffering from a mental health condition. So that's a picture we saw as well. Poor mental health literacy. Um, so this is, there is generally poor, uh, what, what seems to be generally poor mental health literacy um, within defence. And this is both in relation to individuals about their, themselves and their own symptoms. So not even, un, not, not particularly aware or understanding what, what, what might be going on for them, but also as from external and, and in particular chain of command. So the, there is a real widespread lack of knowledge um, about mental health and for some an absolute denial that mental health conditions like depression and PT, PTSD actually even exist. So I've heard countless times in both clinical practice and my research, the I didn't believe in PTSD until I had it. So that sort of speaks to the level of denial that there is um, and continues to be. What it seemed to be is, is among senior or more experienced personnel um, or, or people that had been in for a long time that there's sort of this culture or um, sort of of, of there's, there's no time or tolerance for issues or concerns that aren't pertinent to to the actual job of the of defense so the actual uh, mission the actual pertinent to life and death or survival um, it, it's sort of seen as uh, not important or, or at, you know not worthy of attention um, what we found is when members do disclose mental health difficulties many matters seemed really trivial or as I said distractions from the primary aim which is training personnel to perform their core functions it seemed that, that recruits and junior personnel um, you know get this instruction to harden up uh, they're labeled as problematic or liabilities um, and they're seen as really being whingers when they talk about mental health a, a, a small case example of this is um, a member that I spoke to um, in the intelligence call. They were showing some very early signs of mental health issues, including some, some uh, general anxiety and sleep disturbance. They did the right thing, um, sought help, um, sort of flagged these issues early, uh, which in itself is, is not that usual. Um, and they were told by their chain of command and welfare officer, if you want to be in the military, start getting used to being scared. And this sounds like a you problem, not an army problem. They were also told that they were becoming a problem because they ended up taking their concerns elsewhere um, to get help. So again, to be clear, there are stories, lots of stories of very positive responses from chain of command, proactive, supportive, knowledgeable and compassionate. But equally, there are horror stories about being dismissed, ridiculed and shunned. And it's almost like it's actually the luck of the draw of what response members are going to get. But that response makes a huge difference. So on the back of these um, challenges is also this idea that, that um, there's a delay in, in accessing uh, evidence-based treatment for these members that, that are showing some early signs of mental health difficulties. So defence itself doesn't seem to have the internal resources to provide this. Uniformed psychologists um, are on the whole, that, that's not their role. They're not providing ongoing clinical care. Um, so this work is outsourced. Um, but with the outsourcing, of course, comes delays. Delays in getting seen, um, first of all, by the medical officer, and then delays in getting referred uh, to where they need to be, delays in actually finding suitable um, clinicians who, who actually are trained in these gold standard treatments. And all of this is happening while the member themselves seems to be, you know, monitored and triaged, um, but they don't really know that they're not getting the right treatment. So that's the interesting fact. They actually think, oh, I'm having treatment and it's not working. Then there's no sort of understanding that they're not actually being treated yet. Um, so what that means is this essentially untreated mental health condition, it's getting worse as time goes on. As we know with PTSD, if there's response, repeated exposures to trauma, um, that this is associated with much higher severity of PTSD. Members then of course start to think, well, I'm not getting any better. So they're gonna try and use other ways to feel better. So maladaptive coping mechanisms like drug use and alcohol use increases. 
of course, following that work performance will suffer, depressive, depressive symptoms rise. Um, and then um, essentially a medical discharge becomes inevitable rather than preventable. So the impact of these challenges, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, isolation, lack of belonging, feelings of failure, resentment, um, and in, of course, increasing severity and complexity of existing conditions. So in addition to these challenges, we wanted to look more closely at this idea of the psychological adjustment process that goes along with um, transition and separation from the ADF. Of course, that event in itself is, is a major change. And just like all of us go through an adjustment process with any major life change, um, it's no different for defence personnel. But what is happening is some people are able to progress through this adjustment process in a matter of, you know, months fairly easily, but some people are really getting stuck here. And so we went, so this is where we did the systematic review and we went into the uh, international literature, looking at all the studies that had completed on this idea of a psychological uh, process of transition. Um, so there were 18 studies uh, and they were mainly from the United States. And that's, you know, the bulk of the research is coming out of the United States, um, given their large population and large uh, military population. Um, and this study has been published and I have provided this as part of the material. So you should, uh, if you are interested in, in reading it in depth, then uh, you will be able to access a copy. So what we found is um, that the psychological adjustment process is really characterized by a profound sense of loss. And that loss is in three key areas. And they are culture and community, identity and purpose. And this won't sound uh, new. I think this, this uh, repetition of this has been throughout this symposium. So what I want to do now is um, reiterate, I suppose, that this experience was going on for, for our sample, for the, for the interviews I conducted. And I want to play you now some excerpts, um, some quotes, uh, voiced by others, not voiced to protect um, the, the uh, privacy of the interviewees, uh, but explain the experience they had with this idea of loss. I lost all purpose and what I stood for, my role in life basically. I still feel that way, but no direction. I no longer have anything important to me. I was drinking seven nights a week, I had no purpose. Why should I stop? You've lost your family and you go home and there's nothing there. So you belong nowhere. <clears throat> the day I was discharged, I thought, well, this is the first time in so many years I haven't been coming home in some way or another. It's like, what have I done? It's like getting out and it's just one set of losses after another. Lost my job, lost work, lost all of my mates. Change seemed like losses and even to the point of suicidal thoughts. I felt totally lost. Out that door, and there's nothing, just a big black hole. Worthless, useless, <laughs> lost. You've, you just, you've no identity anymore. You're not a soldier anymore. You just, you're not a civilian. You don't want to be a civilian because of how many years you were. You told civilians you don't want to be one, but you don't have a choice. You, you are one now. So you don't identify with being a civilian. You can't identify with being a soldier. So you're just in limbo. I, I mean, I went through that for quite some time. I, I came close to, I came close to ending it. So we really can't underestimate um, this process, this adjustment process that people have to navigate through, and these experiences of loss. I also want to. Um, turn to social identity theory and, and think about this in terms of what we're seeing. <clears throat> uh, social identity theory really is all about this, this idea that you have your sense of self and your self-concept and your worth in some respects is, is really defined by your group membership and this idea that there's in-groups and out-groups. 
Um, and essentially what, what you do when you're in the in-group is you maximize the similarities you have with your in-group and while well, minimizing the differences and you do the same for the out-group, but you maximize the differences you have with the out-group and you minimize the similarities you have. And in doing so, you are getting a, a stronger self-concept and, and, and identities as such. Um, so this is something that occurs in all areas of life, as, as we know, sporting groups, politics, it's not specific to defence in any, any way. Uh, this is one of the fundamental ways um, humanity operates. Uh, but certainly in defence, what <clears throat> it seems to be very apparent is, is in relation to civilians versus serving personnel and this idea of an us versus them mentality. And, uh, you know, I've heard the saying countless times, as many of you have heard in the room, I'm sure what's lower than a recruit, a, civ a civilian. But uh, the issue here is um, in the ADF, the average age of, of a member is 31 years old and most service personnel enter the ADF around 22 and they stay in the military around 7.5 years. So what this means is your membership in the in-group is not stable. So more so for those who are medically discharged, it's, it's unstable, but it's also unexpected and out of your control. And this is very damaging. So particularly for those who have developed their self-concept and worth around being a member of this group, uh, the damage then is, is, is really compounded for some who then feel that they are rejected and abandoned by their supposed in-group. And this contributes again to that disillusionment of the system and that resentment keeps building. So as part of this qualitative study, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we also wanted to look at what are the differences between those who transition and adjust well versus those who struggle. And we certainly, again, saw a pattern of results that was fairly clear in terms of here are some things that people who have who do well have in common. And it was very um, obvious, I suppose, when looking through this in relation to the experience of loss, that most people who do well are the ones that are able to mitigate those losses in some ways. And the flip side, of course, is those who don't do well have an absence of these factors. So thinking of them in a way as risk and protective factors, we then moved to the next phase of the research. Now, the next phase of the research really had a couple of aims. First of all, uh, I want to talk through the demographic profile of those reporting difficulties with transition and adjustment to civilian life. So this is the study which had 725 ex-serving members. First of all, um, first of all, sorry, Ellen. Um, we found that 78, uh, around 78% reported experiencing a difficult transition. So very high rate there. When we broke down the demographic profile of, of people who reported transition difficulties, we found it significantly more reported by those who are medically discharged, younger age, fewer years served, and those who experience injury or chronic pain. Interestingly, uh, the uh, younger age, fewer years served, and pain uh, factors were remained even after we uh, controlled or excluded the medical discharge, which was surprising because they, you would think they are intrinsically linked. Um, what was also interesting is the, the null results. There was no difference between branch of service, whether you'd been exposed to combat or not and uh, reported gender. We also found that 50% had reported that they have not reintegrated or adjusted back to civilian life. This was also a big proportion given that the average time since uh, separation for our sample was about eight years. So eight years on, people are still reporting they have not adjusted. Again, the, the demographic profile of those who seemed um, to, uh, significantly more likely to report not adjusting, medical discharge, shorter time since separation, younger age, and again, injury and chronic pain. Um, and again, no difference by branch of service, exposure to combat, uh, reported gender, or in fact, the length of time that they have served. 
We also had kind of verification in this large quantitative sample of some of those aspects of the qualitative sample in that 42, between 42 and 50% reported feeling they don't belong anywhere, they're not fulfilled, they feel like a failure, and they don't know who they are anymore. So what's interesting here is when we think about the, the risk factors for suicide that were outlined in that first report and the risk factors for a difficult transition or, or an, uh, a, trend, a lack of adjustment, they're the same. Medical discharge, younger age, fewer years served and isolation. So the actual primary aim of this uh, study was actually to, to uh, take these factors that we know are important to a healthy transition and translate them into something that's usable. Um, and what we did was developed uh, this questionnaire called the Military Civilian Adjustment and Reintegration Measure or the MCAM for short. So there is essentially two versions of this, this measure. Right now, one that is complete and is released is the post-transition version, um, obviously because we conducted the study with, with ex-serving um, ADF first. And this version is all about um, assessing adjustment, but most importantly, creating a needs profile from this assessment tool. I think Sandy McFarlane made a really good point around what is the point of these uh, measures if they're not actually giving you an indication of need. And that certainly is, uh, was a priority for us in this research. And then there is in development a pre-transition version for those who have not yet discharged. Um, and that is the study that we're, we're currently um, recruiting for at the moment. So to give a, a sense of, of what this, this tool does, if we think about transition readiness and adjustment on this spectrum, obviously there is a great proportion of people that are ready to transition when their time comes and they adjust well to civilian life. Um, but what we are uh, interested in is understanding better and identifying better those who either are not ready to transition or uh, they are not adjusting once they're out. And as I said, most importantly, not only where are they sitting on the scale, but what is it going to take and what do these people need to help them move up the spectrum to either being more prepared and ready mentally or to help their adjustment to civilian life. And to sort of talk about the, the needs profile, this gives us the ability to, to understand, as I said, what, what a veteran might need or a member to move up the spectrum. This is just a visual example um, to, to sort of explain the, the idea of this needs profile. So you'll see along the bottom on the x-axis, there's um, the, the uh, areas of need, for instance, and then the scores on the side on the y-axis. Uh, axis. We can start thinking um, about any areas that fall below this line are uh, really we can we should be thinking about them as treatment or intervention targets so what this tool is giving us is an evidence-based standardized method of assessment but it's also very individualized as as potentially no two people might get the same needs profile so current and former members can actually understand uh, themselves what their particular areas of needs are as well as clinicians So um, as part of the development of this questionnaire, uh, we conducted a lot of uh, an, uh, analysis, um, statistical analysis, and it went through a very rigorous process um, to determine that it is, it is, is a reliable and, and valid measure. Um, so the initial measure, as, as I said, was really based upon all those factors that came out of the qualitative study. So all of those things that came up as most dominant or most common in those who transitioned well versus poorly. And that original measure had 47 items of questions. We then did exploratory and confirmatory factor analysis. And that statistically tells us what is most important and, and really what contributes most to this model of psychological adjustment and cultural reintegration. So the final measure then reduced from 47 questions to 21 questions and it takes five minutes to complete. And the following, these are the following factors that held up as most important. So finding purpose and meaningful activity post-service, civilian friendships and connections, help seeking and the attitude towards seeking help, resentment and unresolved resentments and regrets about service, 
negative beliefs about civilians and also inflexibility and regimentation. So this study has also been published and I have made it available as part of the um, attachments or additional materials for this talk. It is uh, freely available. It's an, it published in an open access journal. So again, if you're interested in further details on the analysis um, and the findings, uh, please have a read. We also have started to look at what are the most common areas of need that are coming up for people that complete the MCAM. So we are using both the sample that we have as well as those who have accessed the MCAM uh, since it was released. Uh, and they, it's quite interesting, I suppose, what the, what the most frequent areas of need are for people. What's coming up as top is regimentation, resentment and regret and negative beliefs about civilians as I guess the most common um, needs uh, for people. In terms of the relationship for, with mental health and how these factors on the MCAM uh, relate to the experience of mental health, we have found that total MCAM scores significantly relate to um, increased uh, depression, anxiety, stress, as well as decreased quality of life. And we've started to pull out individual factors as well. Uh, we haven't done this for all of them yet, but we've pulled uh, information on the resentment and regret factor and what it shows. And just to give you an indication of the type of questions that are around, um, make up that factor, things like I'm angry at the way I was treated during my service, the military broke me and kicked me out. So those with this area of need and those who are endorsing uh, those questions, uh, demonstrate significantly higher de uh, depression, anxiety, stress, and PTSD severity. So thinking now um, about improving outcomes, um, obviously I'm passionate about the research that I've been doing, so I'm going to plug it right now and encourage uh, everyone to go to mcom.org and look at this questionnaire and even take this questionnaire because this is, um, as I said, this we don't have a lot of evidence based in this area as yet. So this is, these are tools and initiatives that are evidence-based and I think that's really important. So when we're talking about improving outcomes, um, here is one aspect. I'm not saying it's the silver bullet or it's the be all and end all. It's certainly one part of a much larger picture in someone who is transitioning and reintegrating to civilian life. But it is a part where we now know, we now have a way to um, filter through all the information um, and, and cut to what are the key needs in someone's psychological adjustment. On top, as well as that, um, in terms of improving outcomes, a very exciting next phase of the research. So essentially the fifth phase of this research is the development of the Go Beyond program. Now this program is directly linked to the MCALM factors and knowing what those important factors are and mapping them on to specific training modules online uh, that, that anyone can access once they complete the MCAM profile. So again, this is evidence informed um, and evidence-based upskilling and training for veterans who have uh, these key needs identified by completing the MCAM. And it's sort of a, we're trying to make it a very uh, key, uh, sort of neat streamlined process for people so that once they jump online and do the um, complete the MCOM, it actually will generate for them um, their particular profile and which will say, okay, here are your areas of needs. The, and it will also say, here are the areas you're doing well in, don't need to really worry about that, but here are the key areas of needs you might need further support in. And if you would like further support, it links them then to the Go Beyond program. And what will appear on their particular dashboard of this program is just those key areas of need that, that the MCOM has identified they may need help in. So this is at a, at a really exciting phase. We are currently in development um, for all the, with 
with the, the total program, but we are also piloting currently um, a selection of the modules with the Queensland branch of Open Arms. So we're very grateful and excited that Open Arms has uh, been interested in this program and agreeing to support a, a pilot um, of, this, of this program. And the pilot, of course, will include veterans completing this program and giving us, absolutely smashing us, no doubt, um, and giving us all the feedback that we need to, to make the program as best as we can. It's also being uh, piloted with clinicians as well to get a sense of how clinicians are going to um, use this material as part of their work with, with veterans as well. So um, I'm going to be summing up now, um, thinking about, again, bringing all this evidence together and, and thinking about improving outcomes beyond, uh, you know, my own research, but also looking at the bigger picture. I think it's really clear that in order to understand transition and reintegration, we really need to take into account the entire life cycle of a veteran. So before they join, through to enlistment, training, service, discharge, and the transition process and subsequent reintegration to civilian life. Because the way you adjust at the end of the cycle really depends on factors that occur at the beginning, throughout, and, and really are reinforced over and over. So we can't be thinking about supporting reintegration or transition after separation. That's much too late. Um, so in terms of some, uh, I guess, you know, notes or, or recommendations in terms of improving outcomes, here, here are my sort of final thoughts use the evidence. So transition initiatives and programs must be evidence-informed and evidence-based. And this is only comes about when it's developed from research and then tested and tested and tested. Uh, you know, this is how gold standard care develops and it can't just be what we think is going to help. It has to be tested out. We need to be thinking about prevention as, as better than a cure. We, as I just said, um, we can't manage uh, discharge we can't manage people from discharge onwards. It's for those of us who work clinically in community settings or hospitals, and we see people at the very end of that trajectory, we're trying to keep people alive. It's incredibly difficult. And, and especially when we hear the journey that they have had to that point and all those points in, in between that could have been different. We want to ensure members aren't isolated from civilians during their service. We want to prevent this us versus them mentality within defence. We need to foster a culture that allows a self-concept to be formed outside the military. And so that might be, you know, as simple as encouraging off-base activities with civilians. So sporting teams, creative groups, but just uh, encouraging this connection to community the entire way through service. Ideally, you know, we want DVA to move from a model of illness to wellness and, and allow much more case-by-case -case flexibility and empower those. So even those who are on TPI, empower them to actually work and study in some capacity if that's what they want and, and that's what's going to be of benefit to them. We want to, we need to really be providing a sense, a better sense of control for those who are medically discharging. And this can be, they might have a say in the timing of the discharge or choose their own medical providers. This is all about preventing that vicious cycle of hopelessness and helplessness. In the same vein, we need to focus on instilling value and worth from defense, particularly in those who are medically discharging. We need to target stigma um, in order to prevent people from becoming ostracized and then subsequently feeling angry and resentful. And finally, we need to invest in a robust mental health literacy and training activities for chain of command. The response of a CO and the message down the chain of command can change the trajectory of someone's life. And I can't uh, emphasize that enough. So that's uh, wrapping up from me. I want to say a big thank you, first of all, to the participants of all of our studies who very, very, very gen generously give not only their time, but, but their, their rawest experiences. And that the reason they are doing it is to help others, is to help someone who, you know, when they didn't get help, is they're, they're trying to provide the help to someone else. 
Um, also a huge acknowledgement to RSL Queensland. They have been our partners and have funded this transition research from the beginning, and they continue to be our partners in the transition research and um, the other uh, veteran uh, mental health research that has been conducted at the Gallipoli Medical Research Foundation. And then also just our partners um, who have assisted with um, pilots and, and recruitment, for instance. So that's it from me.